Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Larry, thank you. It's an honor to be back here at the LBJ Library and to be partnering with you again. We're so glad that Texas Instruments kindly uh, helped to present and sponsor this event. On behalf of everybody at the Texas Tribune, I want to say to everybody in the audience how pleased we are to be here with you. And of course, what a pleasure it is to be on stage tonight with the senior United States Senator from Texas, Kay Bailey Hutchison, who was first elected to public office 40 years ago next month. A native of Galveston, a graduate of, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, you really had to do I that. I had to start huh? off with that, didn't I? <laughs> a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and UT School of Law, Catherine Ann Bailey had worked as the legal and political correspondent for a Houston television station just before she successfully ran for the District 90 seat in the Texas House of Representatives in November of 1972. When she arrived in Austin the following January to take her place in the 63rd legislature, she settled into minority status in two respects. As a woman, she was one of only five in the House at the time, and as a Republican. For those of you too young to remember, there used to be these people called Democrats. <laughs> she served in the Texas House for four years, became vice chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, unsuccessfully ran for Congress, went into the banking business, and then successfully mounted a campaign for state treasurer in 1990. Three years later, she ran in a field of 24 candidates to succeed Lloyd Benson in the U.S. Senate. She finished first, barely, and in the runoff defeated the second place finisher, Democrat Bob Kruger, by more than two to one. The first woman to represent Texas in the upper chamber of Congress, Congress won a full term the next year and was reelected twice. She leaves the Senate this January, having served for nearly two decades, longer than LBJ, longer than Ralph Yarborough, longer than Phil Graham, and nearly as long as Lloyd Benson and John Tower. Again, please join me in welcoming an accomplished and committed public servant, someone who's given her life to Texas and to whom Texas owes great thanks, the Honorable Kay Bailey Hutchison. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Are you sure you want to go? <laughs> Reminds me of the country western song. How can I miss you if you won't, won't go, go away? away. <laughs> Well, um, you have a chance to take it back here, Senator, would no. you? Are you done? I'm ready. Really? Uh, why, why are you so ready to ready. go? I can't wait to um, have another challenge to do interesting things, but on my own time yep. and uh, control my schedule mm -hmm. and not have uh, the leaders say on Thursday afternoon after I've told my daughter that I'm going to be home tonight, uh, we have votes on Friday, you right. know, it's just, uh, or have the Chamber of Commerce annual banquet that you've agreed to on Friday because you never have Friday votes and then all of a sudden you do. Uh, those kinds of things just are so stressful. I can't wait to control my schedule. Right. And as long as I'm doing interesting things with interesting people and um, doing some good, uh, which I hope I will, yep. um, then I'm really ready for the next stage. I don't doubt that control is something you'd like to have back, and I know you'll enjoy it the minute you have it back, but I'm also wondering about whether the way things have changed have, have driven your decision to leave now. I was um, saddened, as I know you were, by the passing of Arlen Specter yesterday. Uh, in some ways, I wondered if Senator Specter, who you tweeted about yesterday, you called him a tough and independent uh, a, a fighter on behalf of Pennsylvania and the country, if his independence is itself uh, fading, the notion of independence in, mm -hmm. in the Senate and in Congress is fading, and if Senator Specter's passing is kind of like the passing of an era. Politics is toxic these days, isn't it? It is toxic. There's no question Different about from it. when you first got there. Oh, definitely different from yeah. when I was first there. And I don't think I would be as effective for six more years as I have been in my 19 years. Um, I want to be effective. Right. I think I have been. Uh, but the atmosphere today is more, well, it's obviously very hardcore divided, and it's, uh, there's a lot of my way or the highway mentality on right. both sides. Right. Um, I'm not a my way or the highway politician. Yeah. And so this, that means it's time for me to go, and yeah. this is the right time. So you're not opposed to working, for instance, Senator, with Democrats when War circumstances warrant. You're willing to work with the other side. You know, the way I have always uh, operated is that I believe firmly in 
my views and the views of the Republican right. Party. I am a small government, low tax, mm -hmm. regulation that fits, but not over-regulation kind of person. Um, but when the election is held, you have either two or four or six years to work with the people who were elected. Yep. And I didn't maybe choose these people, but their constituents did. Right. And my job is to work with them to make progress for our country. And that's the way I've always operated. That's not, I mean, I've known uh, people to say, well, I'd rather have a Democrat than a Republican that doesn't agree with me all the time. Not me. No. You're, 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 this notion of Republicans in name only, this phrase, yeah, rhino. rhino, that you hear yeah. about. You've actually read recently, you say, you know, look, they're just Republicans. Mm -hmm. If you're, you're a Republican, you're a Republican. That's and right. I want to work with you regardless of whether you're to my left or to my right. Right. And I'll have to tell you that the Democrats are the same way. It's very hard for the Democrats to veer away from the leadership message of the day. Right. And it's hard for Republicans as well. I mean, you just have this kind of uh, my way or the highway mentality that is uh, gaining traction. Yeah. And I don't think we're going to see the progress that people want to see with so many in that mode right now. When you got to the Senate in 1993, Senator, what did you go to accomplish? Why did you want to run? Surely it just wasn't just to be senator. You wanted to accomplish something. Right. And I really believe that we had um, too much to high taxes, yeah. uh, that our economy was not working the way I wanted it to work. Um, I felt like having uh, more conservatives in the Senate would be better for us. When I ran, the majority were Democrats. Yep. It's gone back and forth in the 19 years. Um, but I do believe in the basic philosophy that we should have a country that opens opportunities in, um, in bringing people up uh, to have the same opportunities with a good education system, uh, but to celebrate success and to celebrate entrepreneurship and celebrate people who take risk and, and do well with it. Uh, that's what built our country. And I felt like you know, we had gone away from that with a big bloated government and spending and uh, just a constant dependence on more government. Yep. And, um, so that, that was why I ran. Of course, two decades later, Senator, those same battles seem to be mm -hmm. waged today. We're still fighting over spending, over the size and purpose and you know, use of government. We seem to still be fighting about whether government is getting out of the way and giving people the adequate opportunity to be entrepreneurial and to mm -hmm. control their own lives. So why in these last 20 years has it been so hard to move the needle, in your opinion? Well, I think if you look at the history of the United States, it would still have been the same major issues when they were writing the Constitution. I, I yeah. think it's always going to be that pull yeah. between people who want more government and more spending and uh, more uh, programs versus the sort of basics of we need the small federal government, which our founders did intend, yep. and to leave most of it to the states. Um, and I think that's been the struggle that our country has had since its founding. Do you, uh, do you leave the Senate in January considering your tenure to be a total success? Are there things that you regret that you were not able to get accomplished? Oh, sure. I mean, you never feel... Let me ask you to talk about, talk about that. In a legislative body, yeah. you never feel a total success. Yeah. Uh, I think I've been successful in the main things. Um, I, I feel like I have made an imprint on our military and yeah. uh, making sure that we were ready and uh, that we were uh, building up our bases in America where we have training and support and deployment uh, on our own. Um, I feel that I've had... Uh, a major impact on taxes and my homemaker IRA uh, that allows women who work out inside the home to have the same retirement opportunities as those who work outside the home. Yep. Uh, the marriage penalty relief. Uh, I've had a lot of impact, but on the other hand, have I done everything I wanted to do? No, yeah. I haven't. I, um, you know, maybe I made some mistakes. Maybe I uh, didn't get 
Social Security reform. I think entitlement reform is essential. I've introduced legislation right. for Social Security reform. Uh, I couldn't even get more than two co-sponsors for that bill, uh, even though I reached out to Democrats because I wanted to really pass it. Um, so I think um, you don't win everything you want when yeah. you're one of 100, right. but you definitely want to achieve big things. <clears throat> big things and also uh, little things. Little, little things are very important when you're um, representing a state as big as Texas. Well, let, let's, let's go there. Let's go to Texas uh, uh, first then in terms of talking about the things that you were able to accomplish and the things you're proud of. You've really worked very, very hard to, to bring things home to Texas. At a time when the national conversation has turned a little negative on earmarks, that's mm -hmm. the nice way to say it. Pork mm -hmm. is the way that Mm -hmm. is, uh, it is said pejoratively. Would you talk about your view of, uh, of your responsibility to Texas, the work that you've done, and why you think, despite mm -hmm. what the national conversation may say about mm -hmm. the stuff, that you believe this is part of your job? Well, first of all, I have done big national things. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important for a senator. Right. I wouldn't want to just be myopic. But I also will tell you that big states are at a disadvantage in the Senate. You've got to have someone willing to fight for your constituents, or they're going to be left behind. At a disadvantage, how come? Why would you say that? Well, because um, Delaware and New and Rhode Island and New Hampshire have the same number of votes as Texas. Right. And the little states outnumber the big states for sure. And when it comes to formulas and highway funding, um, we have to fight hard to stay up, and that's one of the things I've done, is try to get our highway funding up, and we're at 100% now. Uh, but we were 78 cents when I got to the Senate, uh, because you get nibbled to death by ducks. <laughs> and um, that's just the nature of it. Yeah. So you do have to fight hard uh, to make sure that you get your fair share of um, things that are being done, whether it's a formula or the appropriations. One of the things that Larry so kindly mentioned was TAMIST. Well, when I went on the appropriations committee, I found that a lot of money was going for academic research, and Texas was sixth in academic research dollars from the federal government. And I thought, now wait a minute, I understand California's first, they are much bigger, I understood Maybe New York would be second, but I could not understand Texas being, being third. Six. I mean, sixth, because we have great research institutions. Right. It wasn't like I went <clears> in <throat> and said, well, it should be Texas because we're third in the nation and, and at that time in population, now we're second. But I said, wait a minute, we have MD Anderson, we have UT Southwestern, we have University of Texas at Austin with Nobel laureates and scientific uh, uh, research that is making a difference. Why aren't we in this game? And so I went about having summits for five years with yep. our chancellors and presidents coming to Washington to learn what the priorities of the federal government research uh, was. And I urged collaboration. We formed an organization, an academy, with all of our Nobel laureates and National Academy members. And we started collaborating. And we built our research. Um, with this effort, we went from six to third. Yep. We get a billion dollars a year based on merit, based on our uh, systems and our centers of excellence coming together and putting together better packages that were accepted and peer reviewed. Yep. Um, so I wasn't, you know, earmarking because it was Texas, but I was making sure that we got in the right way. Right. In fact, I've never earmarked for a private company. Yeah. I've There's a difference between private earmarks and then oh, and, yeah. and public funds. Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. And everything that I've done has been for national priorities that are in Texas, that are academic institutions or right. cities or counties or the state, yep. and making sure that we get what our fair share is. And, and let me just speak for one moment about the budget and the way we should be budgeting. Yeah. I am for setting a top line of the budget and making sure that that top line is in line with um, 
an overall economic uh, excellence, really. And our overall spending has been about 20% of gross domestic product for the last 40 years. Today, however, it's 24%, and entitlements are 60%, and we're out of whack. Yep. So I'd set it at 18. I'd set it at 18% now, getting those deficits down. But once your 18 is set, I want to make sure that we don't get shortchanged, that our priorities right. are right, and that NASA doesn't get shortchanged, that our research institutions right. are having the ability to continue the great entrepreneurial research that is making our economy more efficient and the technology that is making our communications more efficient. Uh, those are the things that I think we ought to be doing with a vision, a budgetary top line, right. but then making sure that we're spending the money in the right way. So why is the conversation national? What you say, it all sounds very reasonable, it sounds appropriate, but you know that the national conversation is turned yeah. against mm -hmm. the idea of bringing stuff home. In fact, a number of people, Rand Paul, your colleague from Kentucky and others, ran in the last cycle expressly opposed to the idea of many of the kinds of projects you've talked about. I agree, and I think that is what is in vogue right now because yeah. I think people are scared to death. They see a $16 trillion debt, right. and they see a trillion dollars in deficits every year. Yeah. And it, people are saying, we've just got to stop it all. Right. We've got to stop it all. I don't think we need to stop it all, but, but a reasoned... Um, argument is right. not being heard right now because people are rightly very afraid of our economic house turning right. over. Well, let me ask the question, Senator, from the other side. You know, here in Texas, we seem to have a real hostility to money from the federal government. In fact, we seem to have a hostility to the federal government, period. Um, are you uh, are, are comfortable making the argument that maybe we've gotten a little bit over our skis as far as our hostility to Washington? Because there are a lot of Areas of public life, whether it's education or the environment mm -hmm. or health care, just to name three, where there's a lot of tension between Texas and the federal government. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you feel like that level of tension is properly calibrated. I don't. I think um, I, I agree in many ways with the anti-federal overreach. Yep. Um, I do. But I think the hostility has hurt, in some cases, my ability to get things done or to be able to affect. Um, and I think we could calibrate it better and get what we want and what fits Texas, yep. uh, while also saying no sometimes. And I think in some, sometimes the right answer is no. Yeah. So for instance, in the question of healthcare, right now there's a conversation going on about the opportunity to expand Medicaid. Okay. Mm -hmm bring more federal dollars to Texas, a state, as you know, with 5.8 million uninsured people, 23% of the population. We're first among the 50 states in the percentage of our population uninsured. The governor and other people in the administration here in Austin are resistant to the idea of taking additional federal money. They say, nope, we don't want to expand federal Medicaid. Is that the kind of thing where you think maybe Texas is, is not regarding that opportunity properly? You know, I would look at the numbers yeah. because the federal government uh, in the Obamacare says they'll pay for three years 100%, then it goes to 90%, right. but you've got more people that are going to have to be picked up. Right. And I would really look at what the dollars would be that the federal government would be putting in, what the state would have to put in, and if it could be done more efficiently. Yeah. One of the things that, that I know um, that... I would look at, and I think the state has looked at, is could you get the money in a block grant with flexibility, say, and go to a Blue Cross or another health insurance company and say, we will give you the Medicaid dollars for this family of four if you will take our, our Texas amount and then you will give the insurance for that family. Yep. Um, and can you do it better that way and give better service uh, to the people in their health care, right. but also do it in a more efficient way? I think it's right to question. I do. Um, 
And I don't know what the answer is because I haven't looked at the details of right. how long we would, I mean, how much we would have to do in federal regulations and coverage and expansion versus what you could do with the money as well. Yeah. But at a minimum, flexibility would need to be a, a, part, oh, a part of any conversation. Definitely. You, you referenced, uh, Senator, the Social Security reform that you had hoped to do previously. Not successful, but you tried. Mm -hmm. Obviously, entitlement reform is a major topic right now in the presidential campaign. It's a major mm -hmm. topic in Washington. We're very concerned about the cost of Medicare. What are we going to do about Social Security? Could, could you offer a little guidance? You're liberated now from having to run for re-election. You don't have to raise any more money. So just among the hundreds of us in this room, just tell us the truth. What should we be actually be doing on entitlement reform if you had your, mm -hmm. if you had your wish? Well, just as an example, we, we have to bring entitlements down to an amount that can be covered with our gross domestic product. If you kill your, your industry, your... Uh, people who are able to give jobs, yeah. uh, the, gold, the goose that lays the golden egg, um, then no one is going to have the kind of care that we, we want to give. So I think you have to look at these entitlements, including Medicare and Social Security. I think Social Security is fairly easy. Uh, my plan would have left people who were 55 years old today and above alone. But if you were under 55, if you're 54, you would have retired full retirement, not at 66, but at 66 years and three months. Right. If you're 53, it would have been 66 years and six so months. Gradually so raise the three eligibility. Three months yeah. a year, yeah. you would raise it uh, to a maximum of 68, or you could go to 69. Yeah. Uh, more in line with the actuarial tables when Social Security was passed. Which have changed dramatically, oh. right? Life expectancy is significantly greater. Oh, people greater are working. Today. They want right. to work. Um, right. So I think that you could do that. And then if you lowered the cost of living increase, not eliminate it, right. but if, it gets a, if the cost of living goes above 1%, then you would uh, kick in a cost of living increase. But at 1%, it's not that much, and you would not start until 1%. Right. Do those two things, and Social Security is sound for 75 years, yeah. and the deficit goes down by $4 trillion. Why couldn't you get a co-sponsor on the Democratic side, or for that matter, 99 co-sponsors across the parties for a plan like that? Well, I asked the same question. Yeah. Don't know why. Is it because you, Social Security, as Pat Moynihan famously said, is the third rail of politics? Is well, that what it is? I think that if we had leadership, on both sides of the aisle and the president. The president did nothing on Social Security So you, you attempted to do Social Security reform in this administration? Yes. Was Governor Bush or President, we know him as Governor Bush a little bit, pardon me. Uh -huh. Was President Bush any better on Social Security reform than the President well, Obama's he, been? He did try to do a privatization that would give people a choice. Right. How would that have worked out given the way the economy's gone the last couple of years? Well, actually, it would have been hard during these times, yeah. but you would have had choices that wouldn't have involved um, wouldn't have involved stock uh, um, equity um, tranches, and you could have chosen what you wanted to do. Right. You could have even had government bonds, but um, in the end, it would have been much more sound. Preferable I mean, to what we have know, right now. Yeah, and you yeah. know that there have been a few counties in Texas right. that have actually Galveston been on Galveston County, yeah, for instance. Galveston County. Right. It's a, it's a privatized system where you could make a choice, and, and it's working fine. Of course, people are concerned that if you give money over to people and they invest it and they lose it, then they're just totally out of it. Yeah, but you wouldn't do that. You yeah. would have a very set right. requirements for the kinds of funds that right. you could could go into, right. uh, and they would have to be balanced, and you wouldn't allow uh, people to just go in and um, make investments that would be clearly risky. Well, one thing I didn't hear you mention, Senator, and I want to ask you about this in terms of Social Security but also Medicare, is means testing. Mm -hmm. People who hit a certain income threshold may not be as desperately in need of those funds as people with lower incomes, and so maybe one way to lower the amount of obligation that the federal government has is to means test for those kinds of entitlement programs. What about, what about that? Well, I don't like means testing, especially for Social Security, yeah. because I think people should never 
when they've earned something, saved it, it's not an it's not a welfare program. Yeah. It's something that they have worked for and earned. It's theirs. Yes. Now you could do something on the edges that say you would never lose what you put in. You right. would have a certain amount that would be required, but you could do less in say the cost of living increases. Yeah. And that wouldn't hurt the people that have invested, right. but yet would bring down the cost. So you could do something on the edges like that. Right. Uh, on Medicare, that one is uh, harder because it is something that has just grown. Right. Um, and the cost of health care has grown so much that right. it's not feasible uh, with the system that we have now. Got to do something. But you, you yeah. do have to do something. And I think it has to be giving people more of a choice. The one-size-fits-all program, which is one of the big problems with Obamacare, um, I think is never going to work. I think it's right. going to, to sink from its own weight because you know, some people would rather have a, a big deductible right. and pay less month to month. Some people would rather have a small deductible and pay more month to month. Yeah. Some people need OB-GYN. Some people need... Um, um, you know, elderly care. So you, you need to be able to choose what fits your budget and your needs and what you want to do. Or maybe you want to um, have the ability to go to a boutique uh, doctor right. and pay a certain amount and not be in the Medicare system. So, but it, it is important that whatever we do in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that the reimbursements to the healthcare community be enough that they will take the patients and give them the good care. So one criticism of the President's Affordable Care Act is that in the cuts he's made to the program, mm -hmm. he's reducing payments to providers and that that puts the system and at some risk. Then that's going to make a second class tier. The, the, the plan mm -hmm. that Governor Romney is advocating in opposition to the Affordable Care Act is largely, it's called premium support in quotes, which basically a voucher. It takes, mm -hmm. it's so a voucher. you turn money back over to people. But the Kaiser Foundation put out a study today that said that in fact the cost to seniors under that plan would actually go up quite dramatically. This doesn't concern you? that if we give more control over that the result might be costs go up for individual seniors? I don't know what they base that on. So right. I guess I can't comment because I think that is uh, an idea that has merit yeah. to let people have a certain amount and yeah. then if they want to go beyond that, they can. Yeah. Uh, but it would be an amount, but you wouldn't shortchange the healthcare community in the process because you want people to have a choice that gives them good care and quality care. I mentioned, Senator, because tonight is kind of a valedictory. It's a celebration of all your years. I want to touch on the legacy pieces. And you mentioned, uh, Larry mentioned TAMIST, and you mentioned the importance of research. Higher ed generally has been something, as I've known you over the years a little bit through Texas Monthly and now the Tribune, you've talked about higher ed almost every time we've been together mm -hmm. as something that you consider to be so important. I know that we are sitting on the campus of your alma mater today. But I want you to talk a little bit more expansively than just UT about why you think higher ed is so important. And what is the appropriate role of the federal government and what's the appropriate role of the state government in making those opportunities available? You may have heard that over the last year we've had kind of an interesting discussion about higher ed reform. Kind of. So you've heard a little bit about that. So yeah. I wonder if I can ask you to talk a little bit about the importance of higher ed as one of the things you've thought about for so long. Well, first of all, for Texas, I want our state to be known and respected as a high quality academic um, higher education providing state. Yep. I think the number of major companies that move here, they want an educated workforce. They want the research capabilities to do public private partnerships and have great research, and then they want their students who come out to have been around great research and great programs. We will not be a state that is respected in America and the world if we're not a high quality, academic, excellent institution. Are we there now? Which, in which includes yeah. great research and attracting the best professors, which attract then the best students yeah. and give them the best opportunities uh, to learn in, in a way that will make them productive yeah. citizens when they're hired. And we have 
great tier ones. We have three. We should have six. Yeah. And we should know which ones can be the six, and we need to put the money there and prioritize it. So why, why haven't we so far, Senator? Well, I, I think that any talk of devaluing research is not productive. Yeah. And it is hurting our image, and we need to, we need to say, look, I'm not against experimenting with um, four-year, $10,000 degrees, but you don't do it with your flagships. Texas and A&M and Rice, of course, but Rice is private, but um, they are good, solid, big-time academic institutions that are highly rated in the country. And that is a draw. It's a draw for business. It's a draw for research uh, sharing and collaboration. And we need to have three more, and we need to put the money into three more. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have six that are on the cusp. I would um, I'd make those decisions based on who has the capability to uh, get to that uh, mm -hmm. tier one status. I mean, you have a point of view about which three? <laughs> well, I think there, it has to be judged on factors. Yeah. And it, it includes a lot of factors uh, to be in that tier one. I think you are seeing the ones that are emerging. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, California has nine. Right. Uh, New York has seven, and we've got three. Yeah. I mean, that's not this, enough. This, this bothers you. I've, oh, I've heard you say this before. And we, right. we need to have three more, and we need to put the money into three more. And, frankly, there are other opportunities for centers of excellence in the ones who wouldn't be in that six to do better than the six in certain right. fields. Right. You know, I always give the example. I don't want to offend anyone here, but what do you know about the University of Missouri? Well, they have the, maybe the number one journalism department in America. What else do you know well, number, about? Maybe number two. <laughs> what else do you know about Missouri? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So that means they have got a center of excellence, and we can argue about one and two, but they've got a center of excellence that they have they put together, and they've made it the best in America. Right. We can do that. Yeah. with non-tier one institutions. Right. If we focus and we spend our money in a very focused and wise and productive way. Hard to argue with any, anything you say, Senator, but of course, you know, these are austere times. Mm -hmm. State share of higher ed funding is down and it's continuing to go down. Nobody expects, even in, if times return to, to, uh, to level or even a little bit better than they are right now, that we're gonna suddenly return a whole lot of funding to higher ed. There are competing priorities. What do you do in a state like Texas where you've got such competing Good priorities. People want pu great public ed and higher ed and health care. We have a water plan that we need to fund. We have all these ambitious things for Texas. Don't have very much money, and there seems right now to be not much of a stomach for new revenue sources. Well, what, do we, what do we do? Well, for one thing, I'd prioritize the spending. For instance, we have um, the Enterprise Fund that we use to lure businesses here. We do. And, and I'm sure that has been effective in many ways, but I would... I'd put that money, the hundreds of millions of dollars, into education and higher education and prioritizing. Yep. Because we have such a good business environment. Low taxes, reasonable uh, regulation. Predictable not regulation. Over, right, yeah, yeah, predictable, solid regulation. Uh, tort reform that's good. We are a pro-business state. Yep. And I think we would attract the business that is coming here for all of the advantages we have I, I wouldn't be giving incentives, and I think the incentives also mean that you are favoring a new business over one that has been here for 30 or 40 or 50 years and has contributed to the economy. I wouldn't pick winners and losers. I would put the money into higher education and research and the things, or, or maybe even K through 12 in certain right. instances. But I would put it in places where we could build our infrastructure, where we're not maybe looking at the future, and I wouldn't be putting it into picking winners and losers. That, right. That's one thing. Let me ask you about another legacy piece related to your gender. Uh, uh, when you got into the Texas House, as we said, there were five women. Uh, obviously, there are more than five women in the Texas legislature, in the House and the oh, yeah. Senate now. 
And you know, you're, there are many more women who are United States senators today. In fact, I believe there are more today than there have been before, and they're mm -hmm. fixing to be perhaps, 17. Mm -hmm. perhaps to, be, to be more. Um, uh, how has gen your gender and your status, relative minority status, in the Texas legislature and in Congress affected your view of why you're there? Do you see yourself as a, a woman senator or as a senator who happens to be a woman? Well, definitely a senator who happens to be a woman. I don't want people to think of me as the woman senator from right. Texas. Um, however, I do think that the importance of electing women yeah. is that you have all of the experiences that are necessary to make good law and good policy. Right. So I have focused on some things that, in my experience, were lacking. Homemaker IRAs. Why would we give opportunities for people who work outside the home to save tax-free for their retirement but not allow homemakers to do that when they're the ones most vulnerable in yeah. retirement security? Um, I experienced that and um, was not able to continue giving to my IRA, which I'd started as a single working woman when I got married. And I said, uh, if I ever have a chance, I'm going to change this. Right. And I did. Yeah. And it could be the marriage penalty tax. It could be health care. Uh, when uh, you talk about um, not covering women's mammograms if they're under the age of 40, when they have breast cancer in their families, right. are you kidding me? And the, all the women of the Senate, boy, every seven, 17 of Regardless us. Regardless of when party, I, right. Yeah, when I got there, there were uh, nine of us, and we were 100% against allowing that. And that was one of the amendments that we put up that yeah. uh, that was when it was Clinton care before. Um, and we all voted against it, and that was done. And, and now it's back up. Uh, these are the things that we can do, mammogram standards, um, breast cancer research, um, so many things that uh, men weren't against, they just hadn't had the experience. That's why you have diversity uh, in your legislative bodies. Yeah. And so I think it is important to have a group of women, um, and I think it's important for us to bring our experiences to the table. Yeah. And um, but I, I'm, my first responsibility is to be a good senator for America Regardless and of for Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We heard a lot over the last six to eight months about a war on women. I think you probably heard this a couple times yourself. Uh, it often related to issues like abortion and contraception and even in the last few months since uh, Congressman Aiken was nominated to run for the Senate in Missouri, we heard a lot about rape. Would you care to comment on this notion of, of politics being hostile to women, a war on women, and where we might be all uh, thinking about these very complicated, complex, controversial issues? Well, I don't, I think that it has become a political kind of issue that is not valid. Um, the issues that affect women are the issues that we all care about, right. the economy, national security, and um, the, the issues that are being used right now are personal issues. Um, you know, mothers and daughters can disagree about uh, abortion. I mean, that's a very personal issue. Yeah. And um, so having a view about that I don't think is a war on women. I think that is something that has become convenient to use as a political hammer. Um, so... I, I, I don't see it as a real issue. I think we do come together for Americans and mm. um, in in the Senate, and women are represented, and we stand up. And uh, not one woman in the Senate voted against the Violence Against Women Act. Yeah, not one. We disagreed with parts of it, right. but in the end, what united us was uh, every one of us, Republicans, Democrats, across right. the board. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked very hard for certain women's issues, amber alerts for abduct, right. uh, abducted children and um, um, stalking legislation to protect women. Right. Uh, I, I had a stalker for 
probably 15 years. I knew what it was like, and I knew that there should be a way to, I mean, basically, you couldn't prosecute someone uh, before we passed the anti-stalking laws. I did that, I do that with Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. A Democrat, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on some of these more controversial issues, Senator, you've always steered a somewhat more centrist course and sometimes been at odds with your own party on this. You don't feel that women in this country have anything to fear from, from where Congress is coming down on some of these issues that seem to be relitigated, things they thought were settled policy as well as, well as settled law. Well, I think that um, reason will prevail. Reason will prevail. Be nice if that applied across the board on everything, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. Um, Senator, I've waited long enough to ask you about the 2010 governor's race. <laughs> I need to ask you about the 2010 governor's race. Um, do you have any regrets challenging Governor Perry for the Republican nomination in 2010? Well, keep in mind that I didn't challenge Governor Perry. I mean, that was the way it played out, but I... That wasn't your intention? No, not at all. Um, I deferred from running four years earlier. Right. Um, I really wanted to run then, um, but I didn't because it would have caused a lot of hard feelings and havoc. Uh, and on the um, word of the governor to supporters, not to me personally, but to my supporters who asked me not to run, right. he, he said he would not run in 2010. I started building a campaign probably in... 2008 and was building support. On that assumption. On that assumption. And yeah. then in August of 2009, he said he was running again. Well, then I had a real catch-22 because right. people had committed to me. We had a campaign going. Was I going to walk away and leave people hanging or walk away from something that I really wanted to do? That was hard. That was a hard decision. Um, and I didn't want to walk away again. I felt like that was my best and last chance. And I really wanted to be governor. There were things that I felt were not being done. Um, the priorities were a little different. And um, so I just didn't back away. Yeah. So then it got to be, um, I thought it was a horrible race. I wish I, wish I hadn't done it Hor uh, horrible in that way. But, Sen Senator, um, horrible, horrible why? Horrible in what respect? Well, um, I became, Washington and the anti-Washington feeling was put on me rather than uh, running uh, on what I wanted to do for Texas, running on what I thought wasn't being done by the governor. Um, it became a, uh, a referendum on me and Washington. Well, you know, Washington is not the most popular thing in Texas, as you have pointed out. Yeah. And... Um, and my successes in representing Texas were used against me, effectively. I mean, yeah. he, he did a great job. He ran a great campaign. You think he treated you fairly? No. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> in a campaign. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that's politics. Not, oh, yeah. I that, mean, you know, the that's the way it goes. Do you, and do you, think, the governor, uh, do you think the governor senator has, has done a good job as governor and is doing a good job today? Mm. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> well, you know, I think the, the people speak. Um, and if I had thought he was doing everything uh, right for the future of Texas, of course, I wouldn't have run. You wouldn't have run. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, and do you, do you, let me leave the governor to the side and ask the question a little bit more gently then. Do you... Mm -hmm think that the, that the state is doing well now, and are there things that the state is not doing that it ought to be doing for the future? The basics of the state are, I think, exactly right. Yeah. Um, and they were put in place years ago, before either Governor Perry or myself uh, were here. And that is, we don't have a state income tax. Now, I did fight against having one, I have to say, when Bob Bullock said we ought to be looking at a state income tax. I was the sole person who stood up and said no. And I wrote op-eds against Governor Bullock uh, on that subject. Yeah. And so um, I think having no income tax, having a right to work state, yeah. having good tort law and low taxes, um, good regulations are the basics and we do that well. Yeah. Are we looking to the future? 
are we preparing in education um, not only our K through 12, our community colleges, which can be such great incubators for technology training and uh, I think are undervalued. Um, I think they can be such a contributor to our, our state in a very efficient way by sharing local mm -hmm. uh, uh, matching funds. And I think our higher education, I mean, I would have a requirement right now that we have the mission of six tier one institutions yeah. because it, it's, it's research magnets, it is academic excellence, it is, um, and, and I would build centers of excellence, and let me give you another example yeah. on that, where um, I was called by Gil Grosvenor one day about um, probably six or seven years ago. Gil is the uh, chairman emeritus of National Geographic. And he said, I want you to speak to the first Gil Grosvenor Center lectureship at um, Texas State University. And I said, oh, I would love to do that. I am so honored that you would ask me. And I want to ask you, how did you choose Texas State University for your center, the Gil Grosvenor Center? And he said, I looked all over the country for... I think he said three Gil Grosvenor centers where I thought the geography program was the best. Right. And Texas State University was one of the three. Yeah. And I said, that's fabulous. And what I did with my earmarks is I went to Texas State University, I did speak, but I said, you know, this is a center of excellence that yeah. I wanna build on. Right. I want you to continue to be one of the three best geography programs in America, and you can be better than anybody in Texas. You've already got a start. You have Gil Grosvenor, you've got National Geographic, you've got, um, you've got something we can build on. And I said, don't come to me for anything but, but that. That's what I said. And, and did they come to you for that? Yes, and well, they did. I mean, they took did. Took the bait. They, they did. They didn't just come to me for that. Right. <laughs> but but, they, but I, that's what I wanted to build on. And I've gone to Lamar University yeah. where I, I've said, look, you, you have a unique geographic location. You're next to the second largest chemical complex in, a, in the world, actually. And you've got an engineering program, and we need to gear it toward the research and the um, pro academic programs and internships and, and have your professors um, go in with the refineries that are in your area and let's bring these kinds of technical uh, engineers forward and, and they've done that. Oh, they've been great about that. Right. And, and they've, they've built their programs and they're doing some great work there and they're putting out great engineers that are being hired by the refineries in that but This area. is the kind of stuff, Senator, that you think as a state we gotta be focused on doing. Yes, yeah. and the originality that you can do when, you're, when you have a focus right. and that, that right. takes us not to the next five years, but the next 25. Yeah, we're gonna open up the questions in the audience in a second, but you sound like somebody with a vision for Texas, like maybe you might like to run for governor. For no, <laughs> I do not want to run are for you, governor. Uh, <laughs> I are, don't. Are, are you done in politics as well as in the U.S. Senate? Well, I think so. I mean, yes, I have no plans to run. I hate to always say never, because then you'd be the first one back on my doorstep. Oh, I would. And say, I would. but here's what you, you said. on that day, yeah. but, but you but, think you're done. But I, uh, yes, I have no ambition whatsoever, except to have a great, interesting next life. You're gonna write books, you're gonna be a mom, and you're gonna come back to Dallas, at least for the short term? Oh, definitely Dallas. Well, Texas, term. anyway. Yeah. Um, and um, I want to, I want to have a career. I mean, I really right. want to stay in business and I want to um, be doing interesting things. I'm gonna have a um, Kay Bailey Hutchison chair in Latin American law at the law school. Here. Yes, right. and I want to do stuff with the LG, LBJ school right. uh, because we have a, a center of excellence opportunity that we should grab. UT should be the place where you come to undergraduate, LBJ school, law school, if you want to do business and trade or represent um, 
businesses that want to do trade with Latin with America. Central yeah. and South America. Right. This is our hemisphere. It's where we ought to be doing our trade. Right. We ought to be trading and building up the um, economies of Central and South America and Mexico, uh, because strong economies are going to make for a stronger hemisphere. Yeah. Well, Senator, it sounds like you're not done with public life at a minimum. And yeah. let me say on behalf of everybody here, we're going to be happy to have you come home. So thank you very much, Senator. Good to see you. Maybe take a couple of questions.